and I'm using my iPad for this. But one of the things, uh, if you notice in the chat, uh, the textbook chapter, point of view and narrator, they're aligned with each other, but they can be two different things. The point of view is whose story is this told uh, or whose story are we getting? So that's something important to keep in mind. Whose story is this? Okay. And in the case, uh, the case of the Casco of Montiato, whose story is this? Who is telling us his story? And it is Montresor, right? And I even have it right here. He's also the narrator. And it is told in first person point of view. I'm going to change colors here. Told in first person point of view. So he says, I, I had become as best I could. Montresor is the narrator. This is Montresor's point of view. I can't write and talk at the same time. <laughs> Montresor's point of view. And so we are looking at the world through his eyes. Now this ties in a little bit deeper into the concept of narrator. There are two main things that I want you to think about with regards to narrator. is a reliable narrator and an unreliable narrator. So a reliable narrator, can you trust them? Do what they have to say, is it credible? Is it believable? Uh, is it worthy of being trusted? An unreliable narrator, there are some things that you're just like, you're not quite sure exactly if they're telling the truth, if they're lying or anything like that. Now, I've mentioned this, I think I've mentioned this to y'all, maybe in the, the um, first collaborate session, and this ties in with the point of view, a bias. We all have biases. We're human beings. We have biases. It, they're, they're a result of the way we were born, the way we were raised, not, not the way we were born, the way we were raised, our experiences, and all of that, you know, ties in with our education, our history, uh, maybe religion or lack of religion or anything like that. Um, all of that leads into our bias, our biases. Being a human being, it, it goes hand in hand with having biases. Now, it's what we do with those biases that's significant, that's really important. Do we remain limited or constrained by our biases or do we expand beyond them? Do we move beyond those biases? And remember, if you look in the syllabus, it has um, a very rough definition, not rough definition, a very broad definition of what literature is. And literature is anything that challenges our worldviews, challenges our biases. OK, and we're not necessarily judging other characters or other people's worldviews or their experiences. When we start judging them, we start thinking that our experience, our worldview is better or somehow superior. That's when we become biased. And that is what we want to avoid. We don't want to be biased. And uh, but we have to acknowledge that we have biases. Again, biases are our worldviews and our experience. Uh, based on our experiences. So I say all of that because we're looking at the narrator of Montresor. And the narrator in here, we get a little like red flag at the beginning of this story to, you know, that, that gets us to wonder, is this guy, you know, fully, fully there? Is he fully trustworthy? Because listen to this line. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. So there's some key words there. The thousand injuries of Fortunato. Either he is um, uh, a, a sucker, he lets Fortunato hurt him, whether emotionally, financially, physically, whatever, but uh, it's injuries. So either Montresor keeps up with this friendship and lets Fortunato hurt him. Mm, there's something going on there. Not quite sure if we can fully trust him. Or is he so, uh, you know, OCD, so, so rigid that he counts the number of times Fortunato has hurt him, the thousand injuries. Another thing, too, is what does he mean by injuries? You know, was he punched by Fortunato? Was he bankrupted by Fortunato? Or, you know, did Fortunato just not uh, 
call him back. Now, this story takes place before phones, but like in t using today's perspective, did Fortunato just not call him back when Montresor wanted him uh, to call back? Or did Fortunato just not go to Montresor's home for dinner one time when um, uh, Montresor invited him? That really isn't an injury. But if the narrator who's Montresor in this, so this story considers something like that as an injury, that's a little suspect also. Um, he really, really must hold a grudge for him to either count the injuries or to label, you know, inconsequential things as injuries. And then a really, really important thing is I vowed revenge. That's a ginormous red flag. Who is somebody that's going to vow revenge on a supposed friend, right? So we're just focusing on the narrator and Montresor. Montresor is the narrator. But now we start getting into this realm. Is he a reliable narrator or is he an unreliable narrator? At the beginning, you get these little clues that he might not be that reliable. Um, he might be a balance between reliable and unreliable, but he's definitely biased. Not only does he have biases, but he's definitely biased because he's willing to vow revenge. He's willing to hold a grudge. Now, obviously, as the story continues, we realize Montresor is definitely not a reliable narrator. He is completely unreliable because what does he do? As he starts leading uh, Montresor, I'm sorry, as Montresor starts leading uh, uh, Fortunato down into the catacombs, the, the, um, the burial places, the burial plots of, uh, of Montresor's family, he starts mocking. He starts mocking Fortunato. And we see, you know, little things like this. The gait of my friend was unsteady and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. There's a lot of symbolism in this story. Um, the bells, uh, Fortunato is dressed as a jester. Um, the setting, it takes place during Carnival, which is similar to Mardi Gras over here. And it starts off as a religious thing. It's like right after Ash Wednesday. And I'm sorry, it's right before Ash Wednesday. Mardi Gras translates to Fat Tuesday. And Ash Wednesday is always a Wednesday. That's the name, Ash Wednesday. But uh, Mardi Gras or Carnival is where uh, people just go wild. They let their hair down and they may wear masks and costumes and go to uh, uh, costume balls and whatnot. Um, but it is one almost like a cathartic release of all the, the everyday rules and, and uh, expectations they're supposed to adhere to. So it's a big party time, basically. Um, so the setting is very significant too, but we're only focusing on point of view and narrator here. And as Montresor starts leading uh, Fortunato down into the catacombs, he starts mocking him. And we see a little bit here, um, uh, this is where the, the uh, some symbolism, niter, um, he has at length, which is basically sulfur. Uh, and so we get a symbol of, of uh, 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 what's his name, Montresor is taking Fortunato down into hell, it's supposed to, you know, hell is supposed to smell like sulfur, um, which I always get a kick out of. I love, I love symbolism and ritual, but I get a kick out of it because um, I don't know anybody who's gone to hell and smelled sulfur and come back and told me that, yeah, hell does smell like sulfur. But in the world of literature and art and symbolism, the, the smell of sulfur or niter uh, is synonymous with the smell of hell. Here we have um, a Fortunato coughing because the, the smell of the sulfur, and it's getting damp the further we go down. Now, and if you see my note here, ironic, and I'll get back to the mocking, um, it comes later. Fortunato, I'm sorry, Montresor tells the audience, and you have to think who's the audience. Most likely it's us, the readers. He's telling us. So he's kind of like confessing to us what he has done. And when he says, come, I said with decision towards Fortunato, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admitted, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill and I cannot be responsible. Okay, so right here, it's a little, um, a little like uh, uh, 
a little tainted because yes, he says, come, I said with decision, we will go back, your health is precious right here. And remember, he's confessing to us, the readers. So he's kind of like telling us, letting us know, look, it really wasn't my fault that I killed Fortunato. I gave him plenty of opportunities to go back up. Um, I was concerned about his health. And I even told him that he is rich, respected, admired, beloved. Here is where it starts getting a little bit, depends on the way you read it, it gets a little bit mockery, mocking, uh, like Fortunato is uh, 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 mu much more important than um, Montresor, and Montresor is letting Fortunato know that. But throughout the story, we hear other things. You know, Montresor is very proud of his long uh, heritage, his long lineage, his family even has a coat of arms. So this just kind of smacks of a little bit of mockery that Montresor is displaying towards Fortunato. And then this last bit, besides, there is Lucreci. So right here, uh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to this, but you can't see it unless I underline it. Besides there's Lucreci, right here, Montresor really, really manipulates Fortunato. Because remember how, oh, I'm just erasing this as I'm writing. Remember how he uh, convinces Fortunato to go with him into the catacombs after he has, you know, let his staff off. And so he knows, Montresor knows he's going to be alone in the house. He tells him, he promises uh, Fortunato of this very fine bottle. Well, a cask is uh, like an oak, um, oak barrel, uh, this very fine amount of a very fine wine, which is Amontillado. Amontillado is a wine. And Fortunato likes to think he is a wine connoisseur. And um, so Montresor tells him, you know, I've got this bottle of wine, this Amontillado, and I would like you to taste it to see if it's really good. But I can also ask Lucrezzi. Lucrezzi is another guy uh, in this time, this area, where uh, he likes wine too. Everybody liked wine. But Fortunato is a bit jealous of Lucrezzi. And so when Montresor says, besides there's Lucrezzi, and he says that a couple of times, he is deliberately manipulating, right here, he's deliberately ma manipulating Fortunato by saying, well, you know, okay, I'm not going to give you the wine. I'll just ask Lucrezzi his opinion. And Montresor knows full well that Fortunato is not going to give up. He will not give up his chance to shine and let Lucrezi shine instead. So he keeps going down uh, the catacombs. So you tie this with uh, this act of manipulation that Montresor does to, uh, uh, towards Fortunato with this almost passive aggressive and backhanded mockery of like, you know, hey, you're a man to be missed. People will miss you. They won't miss me. Um, your health is precious. Mine, not so much. We've got this really powerful psychological manipulation that Montresor is engaging in with uh, Fortunato. And then that leads us further to, well, what kind of narrator is he? What kind of a man is he? Is he really reliable? Is he credible? Is he trustworthy? Or is he unreliable? Should we believe everything he says? So you keep on going further and you can see you can see more examples of uh, Montresor's unreliability coming out uh, as a narrator. And never mind the fact that Montresor kills Fortunato. And not only does he kill Fortunato, he buries him alive. That is a horrible way to die. So it's not even a quick death or a quick painless death or a painless death, uh, a slow painless death. It is a slow, prolonged, painful death because he is condemning, Montresor is condemning Fortunato to basically live until he starves or runs out of oxygen or whatever behind the brick walls that Fortunato uh, is now imprisoned. Um, Poe was a master at uh, exploring the macabre. Uh, one of the things 
and we can talk briefly about this. There's romantic literature, which focuses on human emotions. Um, and we see examples of that, you know, with Hallmark cards, roses are red, violets are blue. Um, I don't know. Uh, Star Wars is cool and I love you. I don't know. They're really, they tend to be kind of cheesy uh, poems, but it still deals with love. But an important part of romanticism is the belief that humanity is good. Let's see, belief in humanity as good, fundamentally good. Uh, we're not fundamentally evil. We are fundamentally good. Dark romanticism I'm just going to put dark R, also known as Gothic. And that is what Poe, uh, uh, the category of writer he is. Um, he wrote Gothic literature. He wrote uh, dark romantic poetry and, and fiction. I'm sorry. Um, dark romantics believe uh, belief in humanity as complex. That's a funny why. We are neither good nor bad. We are both good. I'm going to put evil, actually, because that's a, uh, a stronger uh, uh, adjective. We are good and evil. And it was, as a result of that, we, have, uh, we experience terrors. We experience fears. We experience jealousy. We experience the need to, uh, to seek revenge. And remember the beginning of the story where Montresor says, I vow to revenge. Um, and then the ending of the story, we see Montresor bearing alive Fortunato. That is a horrible thing. And then knowing full well, we get a little bit over here where uh, uh, we see Fortunato realizing what is happening. He's even trying to play it along, you know, like, oh, it's a joke. It's a joke. Um, you're very funny. He even says a very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> and here we see Montresor mocking him again. The Amontillado, like, yeah, we're going to have a, a, a good laugh over this joke I'm playing on you uh, by bearing you, you know, uh, sealing you inside, chaining you against the wall and then sealing you uh, behind the brick that I'm building up. Um, and we'll, we'll drink that Mont Amontillado finally. Not until just a little bit further where um, he says, well, right here, he says, you know, Lady Fortunato and the rest, you know, this is uh, Fortunato talking, um, Lady Fortunato kind of reminding Montresor that, you know, hey, he's married, uh, uh, we'll join them. And he goes, let us be gone. In other words, let's, let's get away from this place. And while Montresor is steadily putting brick by brick by brick, uh, continuing to bury Fortunato alive, he goes, yeah, or yes, I said, let us be gone here is where it's really, really haunting. This is where Fortunato realizes there's no hope for him. Montresor isn't playing a joke. Montresor is slowly killing him. He goes, for the love of God, Montresor. And here is more of Montresor's mockery. Yes, I said, for the love of God. We see this, uh, this horror right here. Montresor has vowed revenge and he takes revenge on uh, uh, Fortunato for those, those supposed injuries, even when he said, when uh, we're told, Montresor says, there came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. So is he feeling a little sorry? you know, or regretful that he's just killed his friend or he's killing his friend. Um, but then he says it was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. So basically, it's not, you know, that he's just buried his friend alive. It's that it's really cold down there in the catacombs. And that's what's making him sick. The story ends with, I hasten to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up against the new masonry. I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat. And we get a little, 
I think it's in your text. This is a different cover, a different version of it, of the story. But we get a translation for those of us who don't know Latin or who studied Latin like 100 years ago and forgotten it. It translates to, may he rest in peace. So he's giving this final prayer towards Fortunato, may he rest in peace. But he just murdered him by burying him alive. And sticking with the, the realm of narrator, we definitely see that Montresor is an unreliable narrator because uh, he's homicidal and he's um, probably mad, not mad as an angry, but mad as in crazy. And because of that, uh, even though throughout the story he, he uh, tells his story and there's clear logic to it, and because of that clear logic, and he's drawing us in, the readers, and letting us know, look, I did try to warn Fortunato. I did say, let's go back up. I'll just get Lucrezia to taste the wine later. Um, he is basically making us, his readers, his accomplices in the murder of Fortunato. That is some masterful, masterful manipulation. And uh, there, there's, I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. Montresor is highly intelligent. Uh, but he's also sociopathic, and those two things combined are quite scary. So when you read a story, you look at the point of view. Whose story is this? And uh, uh, kind of like an a actual, you know, like material way of looking uh, in order to determine whose story is this, who appears in the story the most? Like, who has most real estate? And what I mean by real estate is, you know, the words appearing all throughout the story. Who appears most in the story? If you see a story with a uh, first person point of view, I, we, um, chances are that will be the narrator telling the story. That's the point of view. But when you get into a story like, where are you going? Where have you been? It's told in third person point of view. So we don't get that first person, uh, you know, with any of the characters saying, I felt this way, I did this. It might be a little bit more difficult to determine whose story that is. So when it's a story told in third person point of view, you can start looking at, okay, whose name appears the most, who's getting more screen time or more real estate on the page. And in the case of where are you going, where have you been, that is Connie's story. We are seeing what's happening through Connie's eyes, even though it's told in third person point of view. The narrator is this outside character, but the narrator is telling us um, what he or she sees through Connie's eyes. And you can determine whether the narrator is reliable or unreliable and uh, where are you going, where have you been? But in A Cask of Amontillado, the narrator is definitely unreliable. Okay, so this is just the really, really quick uh, lecture. I honestly don't know how long this is, so if it's longer than quick, I apologize. But I gave some good information, and I used this story, A Cask of Amontillado, for uh, a really good guiding, guiding light on uh, narrator and point of view.